improvise. They did a lot of improvisation that is very true to the spirit of the game because the best things that happen in the game and in the movie are unpredictable. In the movie, where is the emotion coming from? Uh, kind of everywhere. It's kind of coming out the seams. It's a movie that is full of heart and humor, and that's why I think we all came onto it. Because I know that when I read the script, I was like, okay, Dungeons and Dragons, what do they got? Because that's how I feel as a fan. I was worried. And then I read the script, I'm like, oh man, this is good. Like, it cares. It has heart. It's very funny. There's this endless sense of adventure. And then you got to make the film and seeing that people felt the same way as us when they watched it is so incredibly gratifying. What is it exactly that you bring to this? I'm a planner. I make plans. So you make plans that fail? No. He also plays the loot. Not relevant. When I got the script, I, I thought, I I'm sure this isn't for me. And then I laughed and laughed. I think these are the two Johns are really funny screenwriters. And there was a lot of uh, Monty Python-esque humor in it. Uh, and th yes, I, so that's a absolutely vital element of this film. And no, agreed. That's for me was the big uh, appeals that it had heart and it had humor and uh, a great combination of my book. So how do we pull that off? Uh, Figure it out over a drink? Probably best. I just, I really adore the love that was put into this. I gotta say, you don't see that very often, you know? And I think it's because it's an IP that has so much promise because there's so much to it. And like, you've got over what? Almost 40 years of history with D&D, with &D, if not more. And you know, I mean, come on, there's so much to explore. There's so much to dive into and so much attention to detail. And like, bro, don't you dare ever, you know, mess around with what was already built, with the worlds that were built. Don't misspell or mispronounce the names of these places and locations and characters. I'm like, <laughs> I'm walking on eggshells over here. But at the same time, if you see what the art department did with the animatronics, you know, special effects uh, department did, visual effects did, you're like, oh, wow, everybody really was like bringing the the top of their game to the to the table to really really show love to to Dungeons and Dragons and what it represents and I thought you know what I got to bring it too then <laughs> you got this right I know you don't we also need courage Back to school magic and you I played with my family before I left so I got a, a, a semi immersion my nephew's a huge player so I talked to him about it so I learned quite a bit, but really, at the end of the day, it's just make believe, and you know the script kind of explained it itself. And like any script, you try to bring to life. You read the script, try to bring that reality to, to life. What did the directors do to help with the immersion? <laughs> um, improvise. They did a lot of improvisation that is very true to the spirit of the game, because the best things that happen in the game and in the movie are unpredictable. And so I think that's why, like, the, what we showed in the room, and hopefully, you know, if people who weren't in the room can read the read the write up and understand that there's a lot going on with the tone. And I, I hopefully they walk away from it and feel like, yeah, they listened and we get it and we're excited. And I, that's my only hope, you know, is you work so hard, you want people to fall in love with it. And so hopefully, hopefully we have that. This one's dangerous. But whatever happens. We'll be ready. Can you believe it's been 20 years since Resident Evil? Your first go around with that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, it was, man. Do you know what? That was one of those things where, like, I played the video game a lot. I found out they were doing a movie. I would fresh to the movie industry because I'd just done Fast and Furious. And I was like, hey, I called my agent at the time and I was like, hey, you know what? Can you get me a, 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 you know, a phoner with this director guy who's doing Resident Evil? And that's how it happened. It's that easy. Well, I mean, it was for me at 20, 22. I mean, you know, I don't know if it's that easy for me now. I don't know. Maybe they'll answer the phone. Maybe they won't. Who knows? Walking out of that stage was incredibly emotional. I've been coming to Comic-Con since Iron Man 1, um, when, when we brought that to Comic-Con back in 2006 or 7. And uh, I've always been behind the behind the screen, you know. I've been executive producer on six giant Marvel films, 
running around, putting it all together and like making it all happen, but never stepping onto the stage. And so when I stepped out there today, after having spent the last two plus years producing this film, and I walked out on a Hall H and I saw all the people and I felt just that room and the love. And I, I had this realization that like, I grew up in this room, like I grew up at Hall H, like since I was a kid making Iron Man 1. And like, here I am now on Hall H on the stage with a movie that I'm so deeply proud of. And it just felt like electric. I had to stop myself from just bursting into tears because it just felt so overwhelming to have like looked at like, I've been coming since 2006, it's now 2022. And I'm sitting here with this movie, with this cast, with these directors, I'm so proud of them. I'm so proud of how it's come together. And I was just like, man, it was goosebump city. It was crazy feeling. We didn't mean to unleash the greatest evil the world has ever known, but we're gonna fix it. How hard is it to bring something to the fans and show it to them and then know they have to wait so long to see it? I mean, that part's easy for me because I get to go, look at this, and then we leave. And uh, you got a lot of anticipation you gotta deal with, you got a lot of speculation you gotta deal with, you gotta go home and come up with ideas about what you think happened. And that's fun because now I get to read all that online and I'll follow along in the comment section and the talkbacks and in the Twitter feeds and everything else on Reddit and go, oh, well, that's right. Well, that's not right. Oh, I wonder if he knows how right he is about that. Well, that, that, she's very wrong about that. And it's really fun to play along. So, so that part for me, is uh, is easy the after part it's the going part that's scary because you want to look at the material and you want to make sure that you have something that's going to give people the right sense of the movie you know like the movie is look it's a two hour and you know whatever minute movie and like the world is going to see the whole thing eventually and they'll get to experience it all but you have to communicate so specifically like what are we saying what are we telling the audience about this movie and that decision making process of like okay this mixture of this clip and this clip and this behind the scenes and this trailer, we think they'll walk away and have the right understanding of the tone of the movie. Because to me, it's all tone, right? Like these movies live and die on tone. You know, you can have billions of dollars for visual effects. If you don't have the right tone, no one cares. And so, so it's like, how do you communicate tone? And tone is nuance, right? Like tone is not like, ba 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 ba. like tone is nuance. And I think a lot of the trailer world that we live in today is not that nuance, right? It's like big, loud, bong, 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 shot, shot, shot. So how do you communicate tone?